So Anna Faye MacLeod, um, uh, she obtained her PhD uh, in 2016 from, I believe, Ludwig Maximilian's University. Uh, I met her at ESO because uh, uh, she was essentially working at ESO. So she graduated in 2016. Then she moved to New Zealand to work first as a software engineer and then as a postdoctoral researcher. And she stayed there until 2018. Yeah. Then, then I, 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 I stopped keep, uh, being, uh, keeping track of her, but uh, now she's a Hubble Fellow based at the University of California, Berkeley, so relatively nearby. Uh, and we'll move uh, soon in October to start an assistant professorship at Durham University in the UK. So she has moved uh, through the entire world. She is uh, an expert in the study of star formation and feedback from massive stars. And in particular, she has been in, in several relevant results uh, which rely on new, very, very uh, cool instruments, such as Muse on the VLT. So her talk will be about the stellar feedback and galaxy evolution in the era of IFUs. So let's welcome Anna. Um, uh, thanks, Roberto, and thanks for having me. I'm going to start sharing my screen, and we have tested this earlier, so it should actually um, work. Let's see. All right. Okay. So here we go. Um, yes, so thanks for having me. Um, I was just saying earlier that this is a, a very welcome um, interruption to an otherwise, uh, of course, coronavirus dominated daily routine made of uh, homeschooling my six year old and so on and so forth. So if I am a little rusty in terms of science, I apologize. I haven't been able to do much of that in the past two months. Um, Right. So, uh, yes, as Roberto said, I'm going to talk about stellar feedback and galaxy evolution in the era of integral field spectroscopy. And I'm just going to take one more second to make this little window small so that I can also see my screen. So there we go. Um, forward. No. Yes. All right, so just a quick outline of, of what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, I'm first going to introduce a little bit, um, a, a couple of concepts about feedback um, and massive stars. I'm then going to talk about integral field spectroscopy, which is the main technique that we use to approach to, um, in the study of feedback from massive stars, and um, give you a little bit of a shopping list of all the observational campaigns that we have ongoing. I'm then going to talk about a couple of results we've obtained so far uh, in terms of galactic and extragalactic work. And then I'd like to spend a couple of slides on what I'm supposedly working on right now, um, possibly not um, in these weeks, but uh, um, certainly um, what's up next, uh, which is the nearby galaxy NGC 300, which we have covered with um, this brilliant instrument news on the very large telescope I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides. And then um, I'd like to give you a little outlook on what's um, yet to come, uh, so feedback across the, it should say, really nearby universe. And then if we have time, and only if we have time, and if you want to, we could also talk about serendipitous discoveries, which turn out to be uh, a very nice byproduct of these integral field um, surveys. Okay, I have to actually click with my mouse. Okay, right, so let's jump right back, uh, right into it. Um, so why do we actually care about massive stars? And when I say massive stars, I really mean these stars that have eight or more, more solar masses. And the key word here is feedback. So the deposition of energy and momentum and metals into the surrounding medium throughout the lifetimes of these massive stars. And what does this feedback stuff do to the environment? Well, it enriches the interstellar medium with metals, it drives the expansion of star forming regions and it disrupts molecular clouds, it regulates the formation of star clusters, further on it also controls the baryon cycle in galaxies, and it reshapes the dark matter distribution in dwarf galaxies, and last but not least it also dissipates protoplanetary disks. So simply put, really feedback regulates how galaxies convert gas into stars. And this is probably the classical image of the um, um, galactic baryon cycle um, that you have seen um, 
probably many times where you have molecular clouds uh, that are cold and dense and these form stars. These massive stars that result from star formation will eventually explode as supernovae. You'll have intense mass loss rate. Of course, all of this together with possible nuclear activity contributes to these jets and winds which cause galactic outflows. Eventually, these the, the, the outflowing gas um, and the turbulent gas is able to cool again and fall back and the cycle starts again. So there are several different feedback mechanisms which act throughout the lifetimes of massive stars and these are really the mechanisms I mean when I when I say feedback. Okay, so we have outflows and jets from very young massive stars. So these are uh, um, coupled to the accretion process which uh, funnels material to the forming mass of young stars. Of course, we have radiation pressure and ionization. Massive stars are known for their strong stellar winds, and eventually they will end their lives as supernovae. So these feedback mechanisms, or feedback in general, is actually a multi-scale phenomenon. It acts both on the small scales of individual stars and star-forming regions, but it also, as I already mentioned, um, acts up to, um, on scales up to the very large scales of entire galaxies. You can see this uh, um, uh, as an example in this simulation by um, Phil Hopkins, where if you seed your simulation of a forming galaxy with uh, a whole lot of feedback, so say you have like a button that you can uh, crank up and down and this button gives you more or less feedback, well, if you turn it all the way up and you put in as much feedback as you can, then you'll just notice that the galaxy will sit there and not form many stars at all. Well, if you turn the feedback off completely, then um, the galaxy is going to form stars in what is almost like a runaway process, and almost the entire gas reservoir of the galaxy is transformed into stars. Now, of course, we know that the reality is something um, in between, where um, there is some star formation, um, but um, it is not entirely um, uh, efficient. So. This really means that without feedback from massive stars, the universe would really not look like what we observe it to be. But of course, the question now is, what is, if you simulate galaxies, the right feedback recipe? And for this, we need an observational quantification of this feedback from massive stars as an empirical input to, for example, cosmological zoom-in simulations or simulations of star-forming molecular clouds and so on and so forth. And this is, this is really what, I'm, what I work on and uh, what keeps me uh, awake at night. Together with the following main open questions um, I summarize here um, in the field. So first of all, what is the dependence um, uh, on the physical properties of the star forming region? So how does feedback depend on these physical properties? Can we actually observational quantify, observationally quantify the dominant feedback mechanisms? How does feedback from massive stars regulate star formation, both on local and on galactic scales? And, and um, as, a, as a consequence, how are the small cloud scales connected to the large galactic scales? And last but not least, how does feedback from massive star, stars evolve with cosmic time? Um, Right, and so to approach these questions, and this brings me to my um, uh, second uh, sort of chapter of the talk, we use um, so-called integral field spectroscopy, um, which uh, I'm sure you've heard about quite a lot in the last couple of years, but here's the sort of quick summary slide of what um, integral field spectrographs or IFUs, integral field units, I'm gonna call them IFUs from now on to keep um, things short. Uh, of what, what the concept is. So IFUs um, are really cool because they combine what is conventional 2D imaging and conventional 2D spectroscopy into so-called spectral data cubes in such a way that for each individual pixel in um, a 2D image, you will have a spectrum that spans across the entire wavelength range covered by your instrument. So essentially you'll have a data cube which is made out of uh, um, individual 2D images that are stacked across that wavelength range uh, and, and gives you the data cube. 
And this is very cool when it comes to feedback and massive stars and gas studies, because if you have enough spatial resolution, you can get the photometry and the spectroscopy of the stars and the gas at the same time with the same instrument, which is absolutely fabulous. So it will let you identify and classify the massive stars in your field of view. You can uh, determine gas kinematics and gas properties. You can directly link the gas and the stars and therefore derive feedback quantities. And I'm going to go into this um, a little um, further on in the talk. And thanks to the fact that um, now we can build these instruments with pretty large spatial coverage, we can do this for entire nearby galaxies. Um, and again, I'm going to give a couple of examples of that. So um, there are, of course, many IFUs out there. Um, I'm just highlighting uh, the ones that I mainly use, which are MUSE and KMOS on the Very Large Telescope. There is also um, KCWI on Keck and CITEL on CFHT, which is going to um, be up for another four, hopefully five years. But again, um, this is absolutely not uh, an exhaustive list. So let me um, quickly go through this, what I already called a shopping list of uh, the observational campaigns that we have ongoing. And I really apologize for the amount of text on the slide. It's the only one that looks like this, I promise. Uh, so we, I divided this into what I'm PIing and what I'm collaborating on. So um, in terms of galactic and extragalactic IFU feedback campaigns that um, I've been PIing over the last couple of years, we have the following. So this is a galactic work. Um, there is a beautiful data set of the so-called pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula in M16. We have MUSE data on the pillars in the Carina complex. We have, um, again, MUSE observations of the Trumpler 14 star cluster, which is one of the massive star clusters in Carina, and the surrounding clouds. So these are all um, tiled mosaics, not single pointings. Um, and then there are, um, uh, there's a KMOS data set of three star forming molecular cloud clumps, again in the Milky Way. And then going extra galactic, we recently obtained uh, data of two star forming um, complexes in the large Magellanic Cloud, um, as well as uh, a com complementary data set of star forming regions in the small Magellanic Cloud. And again, I'm going to talk about this in a couple of slides. And then there's this NGC 300 uh, data set. NGC 300 is a nearby galaxy at about two megaparsec distance. Um, and you see most of these things have been observed with MUSE, but we recently also observed um, H2 regions in M33, which um, my student in Berkeley is working on with KCWI, which is this IFU on Keck. Then, of course, there are um, large IFU campaigns to um, image entire nearby galaxies. And here I want to really highlight um, two of these. So there is SIGNALS, which is a mouthful, stands for Star Formation, Ionized Gas, Nebular Abundance Legacy Survey, um, which is PI'd by Laurie Rousseau-Neptin at CFHT, which uses CITEL, which is a, a, a um, uh, an IFU with an immense field of view of 11 times 11 arc minutes. And with this, we're um, observing um, over 40 nearby galaxies. And then, of course, there is FANGS, led by Eva Schinnerer, which stands for Physics at High Angular Resolution in Nearby Galaxies, which targets with news. So the two signals and fangs are really complementary because they both use optical IFUs to image nearby galaxies, uh, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere. Of course, we combine all of these data sets with um, archival multi wavelength data sets such as ALNA, HSD, Herschel, Spitzer, and so on and so forth. And this really is to resolve the evolutionary timeline, right, of stellar feedback. Stars um, um, are not only observable in the optical covered by MUSE and KCWI or CITEL, but of course, during uh, uh, the more embedded and younger stages, you will um, be blind in the optical and therefore you have to, um, you have to resort to this multi-wavelength approach. Right, so let's, let's have a, a, a little bit of a, um, uh, a look at a couple of results uh, from, from these surveys over the last couple of years. So I mentioned these data sets, these MUSE data sets of 
um, pillars uh, in, in galactic star forming regions. Uh, and this is what it looks like. So here, uh, what we really wanted to do was image these pillar-like gas structures that are really ubiquitous throughout star forming regions. We observe them not only in the Milky Way, but also in star forming regions in, in uh, uh, nearby galaxies. And the point here is that these structures are feedback driven. And because they are exposed to the massive stars that originally shaped them um, uh, um, and their ionizing um, um, feedback, they are also being destroyed by the feedback from these massive stars. Now here, of course, uh, I did not uh, insert a slide for um, um, timing purposes, but really what you should keep in mind is these beautiful bubble-shaped H2 regions where at the rim of these bubble-shaped H2 regions, you have these pillar-like structures that directly point back to the central massive star clusters that are blowing the bubbles. Um, and these pillars really uh, give you an indication of where the feedback is coming from. So what you really want to do um, when you want to measure um, uh, feedback in terms of ionization, you need to cover pillars um, uh, in different star forming regions, so pillars exposed to different conditions in different environments. And then what you can do is measure the photo evaporation rate, uh, so the rate at which these pillars are being destroyed, um, and therefore quantify the, the effect of um, ionizing feedback. And this is exactly what we did. We combined data sets of um, uh, three different uh, star clusters in different star forming regions in the Milky Way. Um, and we had to look at how does the mass loss rate of all of these pillars compare to the number of ionizing photons each individual pillar is exposed to. And you can see that there is a really beautiful um, correlation between these two, which really tells you that pillars that are exposed to more stars or more massive stars evaporate faster. You can compare that to analytical models, such as the Leflock and Lazarev 94 paper. Um, and you will notice that within a couple, uh, a factor of a few, uh, the two, the model and the observations, agree pretty well. Now, however, this is only ionizing feedback. And it's only ionizing feedback on small scales. And what is worth, worse, it's only ionizing feedback on small scales in the Milky Way. However, feedback, of course, acts throughout uh, a whole variety of different environments uh, that are not exclusive to the Milky Way. And so really to observationally and statistically characterize feedback, we need observations in many different environments and we need many different observations. And so the Milky Way is simply not the final frontier when it comes to feedback studies, and here is why. Well, first of all, imaging entire regions is really, really expensive in terms of telescope time. Um, this little white box down here, which is centered on these pillars of creation I showed earlier, um, that's a nine muse pointing mosaic, okay? And it took about four hours of telescope time only to image those, those, nine, those nine pointings. Now, if you wanted to image the entire M16 nebula, it would take you about 180 hours of telescope time on the Very Large Telescope. And if you have ever written VLT proposals, you know, or observing proposals in general, you know that 180 hours of telescope time for a single region is simply not something that you can do. Um, the second reason is, of course, that you're sitting right in the middle, right? Extinction um, is a big problem in the Milky Way. And the third reason, which is probably the more important one, is that the Milky Way is simply not representative of feedback across the vast galaxy zoo that we observe to be out there. And let me go into this a little more because I think it's, um, it's important. So conditions, and this is the key point, conditions in the universe, are, are, they differ. And they vary um, not only with uh, location, if you want, but also with cosmic time. Take, for example, metallicity. So this, is, um, uh, this comes from um, simulations, actually, but we see the same relation um, in observations as well uh, in such a way that uh, you can demonstrate that the early universe, okay, the early universe um, was more metal poor, okay, and we are a more metal rich um, and, and nowadays. So metallicity, lower metallicity, what does this do? Well, um, stellar winds, for example, are line-driven. 
if you have less metal lines, this means less momentum transfer, and therefore you would expect weaker stellar winds at lower metallicities. Also, at lower metallicities, stars are hotter, therefore you have a higher photon flux, and hence, at lower metallicities, you would expect a higher radiation pressure from stars. So these are all um, uh, effects that you need to take into account uh, when you try and, and, and uh, quantify um, feedback from massive stars. Right? So we need to quantify feedback under um, or in these uh, different conditions. The problem is that we can't quantify stellar feedback at high redshifts, of course, because um, or, or low metallicities, because single stars can't be resolved, which is really the exercise you need to do. And therefore, what you do um, is you exploit um, nearby metal poor galaxies to understand feedback at high redshifts to make that, that connection. And here, I want to really shamelessly advertise <laughs> um, um, an Aspen um, winter meeting that we're organizing in January 2021. Fingers crossed that by then COVID is going to be somewhat in the past. Um, and this meeting really wants to bring together uh, communities that are otherwise um, sometimes disconnected. So we want to bring together communities who study stellar feedback and galaxy evolution in the nearby universe, in the high redshift universe, um, from observations and theory and simulations. So if you're interested in this, please do ask me later. Um, we're going to advertise this soon. Right, back to, um, uh, back to uh, uh, the actual things. So, um, what we did in terms of metallicity, for example, is uh, to propose to exact um, what I um, said um, uh, two slides ago, to do exactly that, right? To go and exploit metal poor nearby galaxies. And the LMC at 50 kiloparsec um, uh, distance is really ideal to study feedback. We can totally resolve single stars and the lower metallicity is more uh, closely resembling that of the early universe um, with respect to the Milky Way. So just to put this into perspective, we're now, of course, moving out of the Milky Way into the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is our next door um, neighbor. And um, here we were granted 15 hours of um, BLT time to image two giant H2 region complexes. Uh, if the names mean anything to you, these are N180 and N44. And each one of them we observed with 64 individual um, muse pointings. So we really get a, a good range of scales here. So we have 120 parsec on the side um, in terms of physical scale with uh, a sort of one parsec um, resolution. So here are the two complexes, which um, in total host 11 individual H2 bubbles. Okay, and just to put this data set into perspective, um, the two um, combined have over 12 million spectral pixels. Uh, right, so here the key point um, or the key takeaways are that we observed 11 individual H2 bubbles that span radii from 3 to about 40 parsecs. So we also span a, a, right, a wide-ish range um, in H2 region sizes. Um, we have the result, access to the resolved stellar population. I should say the resolved massive stellar population. So we can identify and classify the massive O-type stars that are responsible for the feedback here. Um, of course, the LMC is very well studied, and we were not um, the first ones to observe these two regions, but um, I just want to highlight real quickly that uh, with the over 60 massive O-type stars that were previously already known in these two regions, we um, added, with the MUSE data set, 10 new O-type stars that were previously unidentified in these regions. So even in well-studied regions, you can, you can still um, significantly, uh, um, uh, what, or you can, you, you can expand these O-types uh, or uh, massive star catalogs um, significantly is what I want to say. Right, um, and of course, you can determine gas kinematics and the physical properties of um, the ionized gas. And I really want to drive this point home. This corresponds to a simultaneous characterization of stellar feedback um, uh, or of the feedback driving stars 
and the feedback driven gas at the same time. So really with these two data sets, what we wanted to um, address was the following question, which feedback mechanism is dominant in these, um, uh, in these H2 regions? So, and ask me later if you wanna know details about, about this, but we went on uh, to determine uh, feedback um, uh, driven quantities, namely the direct radiation pressure in blue, the pressure of the ionized gas in red, and the pressure from stellar winds in yellow. And what you can see, or the main takeaway from this, from this plot is that the H2 region expans expansion in these two regions in the LMC is mainly driven by stellar winds and the warm ionized gas, while the direct radiation pressure um, uh, is two to three orders of magnitude lower. However, these of course are only 11 H2 regions in the LMC, so we sort of run into the same problems um, I was talking about um, earlier. So how does this depend on environment, for example, metallicity and location within the host galaxy? So simply put, I'm going to flick back real quick, simply put, these observations are nice, they're a proof of concept, but 11 H2 regions in the LMC are simply not enough to quantify feedback, is what I want to say. Um, so to further explore the metallicity dependence of feedback, we then went about to put in um, another proposal to observe um, three um, complementary H2 regions in the SMC, in the small Magellanic Cloud, which um, uh, in terms of metallicity and gas content is even lower than the large Magellanic Cloud. So this is partially observed, um, but um, um, one nice uh, already ready mosaic is the following. So this is one of the three H2 regions. You can see this is freshly reduced by the way. So there is still some issues with the mosaicing um, as you can see on the left-hand side here. But uh, you can see um, that this is a huge coverage. Again, this is, I want to say, um, 25 news pointings stitched together. And you cover the entire H2 region with all of the individual results stars. However, as I already mentioned, the LMC and the SMC are also not the final frontier when it comes to feedback studies. Instead of tens of regions with the level of detail I just um, talked about, we really need hundreds to thousands to do the statistical approach in term, um, when it comes to characterizing feedback. And here the reasoning um, is much the same as, as before, right? So this down here in orange is um, it's 30 Doradas, which is probably one of the most massive star forming regions we know of. And it's about 40 arc minutes across. So if you wanted to image all of 30 Doradas with Muse on the VLT, you would have to ask for about 200 hours of telescope time. And again, this is not something that you can realistically do. Um, also, this does not sample or observing the LMC or the SMC only, it does not sample different host galaxies. So how, for example, um, is star formation connected to AGN feedback? Well, then, of course, the solution is to go even further and survey entire nearby galaxies beyond the Magellanic Clouds with these IFUs. And now you're going to say, well, wait a minute, Anna. I mean, if we go further and further out, which means, especially from the ground, we're not going to be able to resolve single stars in nearby galaxies anymore. Um, and here is a very good example of that, where in NGC 300, which I already mentioned, at 2 megaparsec, there's this beautiful HST three-color composite of wispy H2 region and some massive stars sitting in the center. And the same image with news, although here a bit twisted, rotated, um, you, can, you can see that what are individual resolved stars in HST and news suddenly become single blobs, really. So you're going to say, Anna, come on, you can't do that. It's impossible. However, um, I will tell you, it is precisely because we have the high resolution HST um, photometric catalogs in these nearby galaxies that we can harness this high resolution uh, um, uh, data to do a better job at extracting spectra from the ground-based IFU cubes. So because 
of the high-res um, HST data, we get an accurate PSF fit, which allows this enhanced spectral extraction at large distances or in crowded fields. So this is not um, something that I have developed. This is something developed by Sebastian Kaman, um, who originally developed this technique uh, of using HST catalogs and PSF fits on MUSE data cubes for uh, globular clusters. And we simply took that tool and applied it to um, uh, nearby galaxy unresolved observations. So this allows you to identify and classify massive stars in nearby galaxies from these ground-based observations. And the good news is that um, there are surveys, of HST surveys of nearby galaxies such as Angst and Legus um, that cover most nearby galaxies in the nearby universe. So really what we need now is the same um, coverage with integral field um, data. And this is what um, uh, the field is currently working on is in getting all of these IFU data sets of the equivalent galaxies we have HST coverage for. So let me tell you a little bit more about um, this extragalactic work and go into the NGC 300 uh, data set. So um, NGC 300, again, at two megaparsec distance is ideal um, because of its inclination, um, uh, which is very favorable, uh, but also because it is not too far away um, and therefore we can still do this game of identifying um, the, the feedback driving stars. And with uh, uh, a decent amount of telescope time, so here we imaged this um, cyan box here with Muse in about 35 uh, hours of telescope time, giving us access to over 100 H2 regions and their stars simultaneously, plus of course everything else that's in the field uh, of view, such as supernovae, planetary nebulae, and all sorts of stuff, um, even things that we have no clue what they are. Uh, and the, the footprint here, the cyan footprint, um, was chosen in such a way that it would complement uh, an ALMA data set that was already in the workings. And in purple, you can see the uh, tiling of the HST coverage. So this is what the MUSE data set looks like. I've um, not mentioned this so far. Oh, here the seven slid on the um, next line. Um, but most MUSE images I've been showing you are three color composites um, tracing the ionized gas. So we have in red is sulfur two, in green is H alpha, and in blue is um, O3. So here, do you, do you all see my mouse? Possibly? Yes? No? Uh, yes. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. Good. Good. Um, all right. So here is the galactic center for a reference. Here it is um, on, on, on this side. And you can really see beautifully, if you squint a little bit, how these H2 regions nicely trace the spiral arms of the galaxy. So this data set in perspective, um, just to uh, keep track of all the million spectral pixels that you get, which make fitting spectra quite fun, uh, we have over 3 million of these. So it's a huge um, data set again. So let's just uh, quickly showcase uh, what you can do with this HST Muse combination at two megaparsec. Uh, we recently published a preliminary study of five star forming regions from this data set. So here again in white is this Muse um, um, uh, mosaic uh, box uh, on an H alpha map uh, from um, uh, a previous survey. And we're zooming in now to these two uh, massive star forming regions in this little corner, which are uh, this one up here and this lower one down here, which in uh, combination host five individ individual H2 bubbles. Now, um, again, NGC 300 has been targeted by um, several um, other uh, campaigns um, before, uh, um, which have led to the discovery of two wolf Rayet stars in the region. However, no O-type star was known in any of these five H2 regions. And now with the MUSE IFU data, plus the enhanced spectral extraction I mentioned earlier, we were excuse me, able to identify 13 O-type stars, which were previously unknown, confirm the two wolf Rayet stars that were already known from previous studies, and add two more newly identified wolf Rayet stars here. 
and this is just the initial study of these four um, uh, these five regions. Uh, so a quick zoom in, um, here is an HST um, uh, uh, red filter, so it's the F414 filter, and you can see all of these nice individual stars marked here, and the equivalent low resolution blobs in the MUSE data. Um, but with the spectral enhanced extraction, we are able, this is just a, uh, an example of um, some spectra, some new spectra of O-type stars. I'm highlighting here the helium-2 absorption line, which is a dead giveaway for stars being O-type stars. Um, and it's just an example. Um, I'm probably, okay, I was just going to say these are the only spectra I'm showing, but here's another one. This is a wolf Wolfrey star, um, and the pink, both in, in um, the st spectrum of the wolf Ray star and in the O-type stars, are um, model atmospheres for the classification. Right, and also here we went on uh, uh, to compute these feedback uh, quantities. Again, we have the direct radiation pressure, the pressure from cellular winds, and the pressure from the ionized gas in much a similar fashion. And we find, um, just like we found for the LMC, here really is dominated by the ionized gas and stellar winds, while the direct radiation pressure at these later, more evolved stages does not seem to co contribute much um, at all. So in terms of uh, senses of O-stars in these two um, regions or two complexes, um, this, this, uh, this, this study um, is a 100% increase <laughs> in terms of O-stars, uh, in numbers of O-stars. Okay, and it also allows, um, it shows that a detailed feedback analysis is possible in nearby, nearby galaxies. Now, what I should have been working on in the past couple of months is uh, the propagation of this study to the full NGC 300 data set, but then of course we all know what happened in the world, and I've been homeschooling rather than 300, but hopefully this is going to be um, something that comes up um, before the end of the year. Um, another point I really want to uh, make before I go um, on to the last part of my talk is that um, uh, when you um, observe um, uh, galaxies with um, spectra, okay, so spectroscopically target uh, nearby galaxies or um, galaxies uh, um, even um, further out than just a couple of megaparsec, and you don't do this with um, integral field units, you are um, um, limited by the spatial um, resolution, right? So you have spatially unresolved observations, which typically, especially for more distant galaxies, um, your fibers are gonna cover the entire galaxy, uh, which means that with, within that spectrum you obtain per galaxy, you, um, you have everything, every contributing factor within that galaxy going into the spectrum. So it's the diffuse ionized gas, the ionized gas from the H2 regions, and so on and so forth. Everything is packed into that spatially unresolved 2D spectrum. And when you then go on about uh, calculating things such as um, uh, I don't know, what's the pressure of the ionized gas in this particular galaxy, uh, you're going to overestimate these, these quantities because of the contribution of contaminating factors such as the diffuse ionized gas, okay? So with the resolved IFU coverage, we circumvent this um, and we can directly uh, disentangle the contribution of contaminating factors such as the diffuse ionized gas and derive um, uh, independent measurements. And therefore, uh, we can revisit common galaxy-wide scaling relations uh, in, in a, if, you, if you want to diffuse ionized gas independent way, and then relate them to the resolved stellar population directly. All right, so just to summarize what I've been talking um, about so far. So I hope that we um, all agree on the fact that feedback from massive stars actually matters, and we need to quantify it from observations. Uh, IFUs are really ideal um, uh, when it comes to quantifying feedback from massive stars. It also leads to unexpected discoveries, which we might not have time to go into, but 
do please ask me if you want to know more about this. Um, and last but not least, first results towards the quantification or the observational quantification um, are promising. Um, and uh, just a quick uh, uh, driving home point uh, about why feedback or that feedback from massive stars matters. I actually had a look recently um, at um, the Astro 2020 Decadal Survey and there are about uh, um, or over 20 papers uh, that have been, or white papers that have been submitted by the community uh, that contain or are about feedback, massive stars, star formation, and galaxy evolution. Um, so it definitely is something that the community is uh, working on as a hot topic. So let's have a look at, um, uh, in the last couple of slides, what the outlook now is based on this very pre preliminary work I've been showing you um, so far. So there is currently a very significant effort to really map the nearby universe with IFUs um, by the late 2020s. And of course, one of the um, uh, key points to discuss here is the local volume mapper, which is um, on uh, one of the SDSS-5 missions. Uh, it has recently been downscaled um, a wee bit, but it will still, um, in its new design, uh, cover uh, about 2,500 square degrees with IFU instruments. It will give over 20 million contiguous spectra, I mean spatially contiguous spectra. It will cover the entire Magellanic clouds, small and large, therefore um, uh, doing what I mentioned earlier is impossible in, uh, when you just submit single proposals to observe the Magellanic clouds to say uh, um, uh, the VLT tech. Um, the wavelength coverage, oh, it's cut out here. Oh, no, it's not. So the wavelength coverage is very similar to MUSE. Um, it goes from about 3,600 angstrom to uh, the near infrared and with a very similar um, resolving um, power as well. So it's going to be um, pretty massive and this is supposed to start um, very soon. Um, then, of course, we have, again, this is a non-exhaustive list of upcoming and ongoing IFU surveys and instruments, uh, the LVM, which I just talked about. I, I also already mentioned um, these MUSE and CITEL um, large programs, uh, um, signals and FANGs covering over 60 nearby galaxies combined. Then there is, of course, when it launches, hopefully it will launch JWST, which has NearSpec and MIRI as IFUs mounted on it. There is KMOS on the Very Large Telescope, which is sort of the underdog of the near-infrared IFUs. There is GEOMOS being developed for Gemini, which um, I'm co-leading the science team on <clears throat> star formation on. Uh, there is, again, KCWI um, on Keck, and uh, um, really the three last ones are near-infrared um, IFUs. I wanted to mention, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is failing me, um, and it, this is really important because uh, it goes back to the multi-wavelength approach I mentioned in the um, uh, early slides of the talk. So really what you want to start doing is now going to near-infrared IFUs, which gives you insight on feedback in younger, um, uh, at younger evolutionary stages of these um, massive star clusters. Then of course we have the ELT, the TMT, and the GMT, which all have IFUs as, the, as their flagship instrument um, uh, suite. So really it is an endless playground um, when it comes to um, uh, these kind of data sets for this science topic in the near um, future. Um, so the final take home from my side for you is the following. So upcoming IFU surveys and instruments will really deliver enormous amounts of data and hopefully drive significant progress in the fields of star formation and galaxy evolution over the next um, decade or so. Uh, together with my team, what we're doing is prototyping all the necessary analysis tools. So if you do have questions or you want to know more about any of these tools, please, um, you can contact me at any time. I'd be happy to share um, uh, any uh, data analysis uh, uh, tool with you. And this is just to say that we will be ready when all of this data comes in. And with that, I thank you for your attention for now. And I'm open for questions. Thank you Okay, so uh, we will do the hand raising. Oh, perfect. Okay, Gilberto, go ahead. 
Hi, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Um, when you estimate the relative intensity of feedback, or the relative importance of the feedbacks, uh, the thickness of the galac galactic disk has any effect on yeah. your estimation? Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a very good point. Um, and really, the key point here, especially in the optical, is that you, of course, you're going to be you're going to be uh, contaminated by, if you want, the background stellar population, uh, which is is made up in that 3D extent that you you know you cover into um, or you get squished into D um, in in your data. So what you need to do is is first. Um, on a pixel by pixel basis, you have to subtract the galaxy component of the spectra because uh, um, otherwise you can't do anything. So yes, yeah, so the inclination matters a lot because you're going to have more or less contribution from, from, from these stars. Okay, I was actually thinking about uh, asymmetric growth of the H2 regions or the bubbles. Oh, I see, okay. Um, I mean, this is a this is a difficult question, or, or it's a difficult uh, uh, thing to do anyway. No matter uh, where you are, um, if, whether you're in the Milky Way or or in nearby galaxies, right? The three D component is always um, an assumption that you need to make. Um, so our assumption is spherical um, regions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Gilberto. Uh, Enrique? Oh, I think he's muted. Uh, Enrique? I always forget to unmute myself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So thank you, Anna, for the, for the talk. I can see that, yeah, you, you're getting lots and lots of data. Uh, <laughs> and so that should contain a lot of information. Uh, in fact, uh, the one thing I noticed is that so far, you seem to have a lot more data than results already processed. <laughs> yes. And so, and so here's, here's a few questions that I, I would like to pose yeah. for somebody to try to answer it with these data. Um, because, of course, we've been working on models of uh, molecular clouds. And to me, one of the uh, very interesting questions is, whether the clouds are supportive or somehow completely blown away by the feedback. Yeah. So uh, you, you probably know that we tend to support the, the latter view. Yes. So, uh, and uh, so uh, that's very important for models of star formation and for cloud evolution. So one of the questions is how does the feedback energy, for example, compared to the clouds gravitational energy? Yeah. So uh, I think that, uh, that could give us a, a, a look at whether the clouds are going to be more or less kept in equilibrium by the feedback or completely destroyed once you have a sufficient population of stars. Yeah, precisely. So we haven't done precisely that um, 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 equation, um, uh, if you want, with these data sets. However, what we did do is combine um, uh, H-alpha maps um, of nearby galaxies with um, molecular cloud uh, uh, ALMA data sets um, mm -hmm. of the equivalent footprint. And we've done the same for NGC 300, or which, it, which is one of um, our galaxies in, in, mm -hmm. in these studies, um, to try exactly and understand that. What is going to happen um, to the clouds? What are their lifetimes? Um, and what is going to be their dominant disruption mechanism? Mm -hmm. And we do find that clouds are short-lived. Uh, that supernovae don't really do much at all because by the time that supernovae um, um, go off, yeah. most clouds will have already been disrupted by the stellar populations they have formed. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is definitely something that we are um, uh, looking in um, into, uh, and it's mostly uh, work that is being done by uh, collaborators in Heidelberg. Yeah. But um, these data sets go into that and are vital to um, study it. Yeah. Okay, and, and another question that, I'm, that I've just recently picked up interest in is, uh, as, uh, and I would like to know if you, if you have any answers to that or are you planning to look into that, is 
out of the gas uh, surrounding the feedback stars, what fraction of it is returned to the warm ionized phase and what fraction is just blown away but remains in, in the cold, dense phase, perhaps molecular or perhaps cold atomic. Uh, because I, I'm just rea I recently realized that that seems to be quite an important question. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a very important question. And this is where um, the LMC and the SMC data sets come in really handy because you can really um, uh, do the resolved cell population thing um, very precisely. And then what you want to do is um, you want to compare um, the number of um, ionizing photons that you expect from the stellar population that you identified and classified, okay, to the H alpha luminosity, for example, that you see in the surrounding. And then you can see what is the escape fraction of ionizing mm. photons. Mm. Uh, so how leaky or not are these regions? Mm. And in, in the LMC um, uh, and the SMC, it's about a 30 to 40% um, um, of uh, photons escaping the, um, the clouds. Mm -hmm. or the regions. Uh, but then, of course, what we also see is if there is lots of molecular gas um, confining the regions, for example, unilaterally laterally on one side, um, mm -hmm. then that is going to translate into, um, uh, for example, higher radiation pressures at later stages because that molecular gas is going to uh, make sure that less of that radiation and of those photons are being uh, or, or are able to escape. Mm -hmm. um, so the the presence of cold dense gas limits the escape fraction of photons, and therefore you will have less um, diffuse ionized gas. If that's okay, uh, and, and, and do you have any estimates as, for example, what fraction of the gases? return to the warm phase compared to what fraction remains in the cold phase? Um, no, not yet. And, and this again, <laughs> if, we had, if, if we had talks about this in a couple of months, maybe I would have had uh, a more sensible answer because this is really what comes next. Um, so we have, for NGC 300, we, we now have the, um, the ALMA coverage for the molecular gas we are um, now getting the high resolution H1 coverage uh, and we have the ionized gas. So we have the three components and we're gonna do exactly this exercise. So stay tuned. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. <laughs> Thanks Enrique. Uh, Will? Uh, thank you, um, I'm Will Henney. Um, that was a, a beautiful talk, Anna. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. The, quantity of data and the quality of it you have is really quite intimidating. Um, so I, 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 I just want to ask you what, you know, the thing, the question you set up, could you explain to us about these serendipitous um, uh, discoveries that you alluded to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can give you a quick uh, overview. Let, let me um, just share my screen again, if I can do that. Uh, just a sec. So yeah, so it's a massive uh, data set. While well, I do that, it's a, it, these are all massive data sets and there are lots of fun to work on, but uh, there are two, th it's just too much data for me to work on on my own. And that's why um, I'm also very happy that now I'm gonna hopefully have um, a small group uh, of students and postdocs working with me on this so that uh, we get more results quicker. <laughs> right, so. Yeah. Um, um, here's, here's one, for example, one of these serendipitous discoveries, and it has to do with um, the question, how do massive stars form? Do massive stars form via accretion disks like their lower mass um, counterparts? And if yes, if they do form via the accretion scenario, then really what we should observe um, are accretion disks and or jets from these massive young stars. And this has been, um, um, or these um, disks or signs for accretion disks or jets or outflows from massive stars have been observed um, in a handful of objects in the Milky Way. So um, inherently all the models that we have uh, about uh, massive star formation are based on Milky Way-like conditions. And in one of these um, LMC H2 regions I showed you earlier, N180, we stumbled across um, this beautiful um, uh, 11 parsec jet 
coming from uh, a 12 solar mass um, star. So you can see that there is this little pillar like structure coming in or protruding from the rim of the molecular cloud into the H2 region for reference, the um, feedback driving stars um, are mostly concentrated in this area. So beautifully pointing back towards these massive stars is this little pillar. And in the optical image, you can see that, um, yes, you see these gas uh, bow shock shape structures if you want, but really you don't, you wouldn't spot anything. And it's just because we have uh, um, the, the wavelength coverage um, um, and the spatial coverage that you get with these IFU instruments that we are able to uh, tie these gas structures back to what is indeed an ionized or an externally ionized jet from a 12 solar mass star. And this discovery is important because first of all, it's the first um, jet from a young star observed outside of the Milky Way. Um, but it's mostly important because it gives us now access to studies of these objects in non-Milky Way um, uh, environments. And how, how do you know it's from the high mass star and not from a, a low mass star, a companion, for instance? Have you worked out the the, the, the momentum and the energy and showing it can't be a low mass outflow? Yeah, exactly. So, so yes, we have compared this, we have compared this to um, um, a dedicated um, um, models of an equivalent object. So this is work I've been doing with uh, Ralph Kuiper um, in Tübingen and um, uh, it, so with, with the input um, to Rolf's simulations in terms of um, um, dust content and metallicity of the LMC, uh, his simulations are able to reproduce uh, jets of this uh, extent from a 12 solar mass um, star. Plus, um, this star is not um, a spectroscopic binary as far as we can tell um, from the data we have, and it's the only source um, in, in, in that um, small region. So we're pretty confident that that's, that that's the, the actual star. Yeah. And then just quickly, um, another one is again, uh, what you pick up a whole lot with these IFU data sets because of the velocity resolution are these bipolar outflows. And this is again, a jet, but this time from a microquasar, which is a term I was not familiar with until we made um, this particular discoveries. Uh, so here we are in NGC 300, um, um, zooming into what is an H2 region. And then this, you can see here pinkish, so sulfur enhanced uh, blob up, up here and another one up here, um, which uh, turns out to be, sorry, I'm just gonna click on, which turns out to be um, a bipolar uh, jet from an accreting stellar mass black hole, which is what a microquasar is. And um, this was then published together with people who are actually experts um, in this area who had the x-ray coverage, which beautifully um, uh, uh, overlays with the red and blue shifted um, um, counterparts of this, of this um, source from the MUSE data. Um, and well, this is another one which I'm not going to go into, but uh, yeah, you can see you can see that there are a couple of fun things that one uh, <laughs> that one can pull out from here. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I should mention that. I mean, the amount of data is is really quite scary. Even yeah. going back to your original paper some years ago on Orion, which you haven't mentioned because you've moved on. Great, but even that, there's so many things in that data set that um, yeah you know, that are interesting, and and that's just a small fraction of the things that you've been uh, yeah. doing since then. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. So the so the Orion data set. Thanks for mentioning that because it's a beautiful data set, which of course is not mine. It's commissioning data. Um, but um, mm -hmm. just to mention what we're doing right now with this is that um, so Muse has now moved on uh, from its original um, uh, first. Uh, light to uh, having adaptive optics for both the small field of view and the large field of view. So now we're using mm -hmm. the small field of view adaptive optics supported um, MUSE uh, uh, um, uh, system to um, image proplids 
in uh, in Orion and other star forming regions. So really, we want to go and have a look at um, feedback at these super early stages where stars are still in their cocoons, if you want, and they're forming. Mm -hmm. They have accretion disks and microjets, and they're exposed to massive stars. Yeah. So, so you actually, so you're you're taking more more observations of Orion. Yes. Okay. That's yeah. Great. Uh -huh. I look forward to, to hearing about it. Yeah. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you. As well. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got uh, Roberto. Uh, yes. Um, thanks, Anna. Um, so can you give uh, a little bit, uh, I guess I could see it in the paper, no? I will. Uh, can you give more details on how do you treat the components from feedback in particular? So when you have the, the lines in news data, if you treat these lines as being uh, gravitationally unbound, or do you determine a fraction of the emission that is bound, and also how you treat the radiation pressure on, on dust? Um, okay. Um, so, so news, of course, being an optical instrument, the emission lines that um, 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 you get are mostly tracing the ionized gas, uh, right? So. Uh, Really, I, I don't think that it's <clears throat> um, sensible to say anything um, about uh, gravitational boundlessness or, or, or not, just with, with the MUSE data um, and these ionized gas tracers on their own, because of course the ionized gas is not the only gas component um, uh, in, in, in the region. Although I'm not sure uh, exactly because you actually have some very uh, a few very massive clusters, no? So what yeah. what we are finding with recon lines, um, in uh, previous studies, and I'm supposed to do that at some point with the Alma MF sample, but we are still reducing the data. So I totally understand you with, with the data <laughs> thing. Uh, uh, um, so so with the most massive uh, compact clusters, if you have if if you have the recombination line relatively close to the to the center of the potential. It's actually possible that that a fraction of the of the line emission that you see is still bound, but mm -hmm. I don't know with this optical observation yeah. because probably you see em emission that is like further away from the cluster, no? So, yeah. so maybe what you say is actually yeah. I actually don't know. Um, okay. That's a good question, and um, I'd be I'd be happy to look into that. Uh, it's a it's it's something that I have not considered with the optical data at all. I'm not sure one one. I don't know. I don't know if okay. one can do it. Because you have some very massive clusters, no? But okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if I, you can send me, if you can send me what you've been doing, uh, um, that would be great. So that maybe we can we can try and do the same for yes. um, the optical uh, emission for sure. Yes. I actually should look at, at your papers and the papers of your group for the for the sample that we have because right. but we, we are still producing all the cubes of recom lines, etc. Yeah. But we are supposed to do actually a study of feedback. So so I want right. to to see the details of what you do. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Yeah. Let okay, me know. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Roberto. We have one last question from Mauricio. Hi, really nice talk. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is uh, a curiosity. What kind of all riots do you find? Are they of nitrogen or carbon type? And if you are interested in determining their local metallicities to see if there is any chemical enrichment. And the second one is uh, how do you deal with the extinction with so many spectra in, some, in so many <laughs> regions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, we find uh, well for you uh, stars of all flavors and natures, which is really nice because um, especially when you have uh, large spatial coverage for um, almost an entire galaxy like like NGC 300, then you can start having a look at um, whether you find more uh, 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 wolf Rayet stars with, you know, a carbon wolf Rayet stars or nitrogen wolf Rayet stars, and that will tell you something about the chemical um, um, enrichment history of the galaxy. So, yes, this is one of the student projects that I um, will be offering as soon as, <laughs> as, soon as um, I start my new position in, in, in DARM. Um, and, but I've already started looking into a little bit for, for the NGC 300 data set. Um, and comparing that to, for example, uh, the metallicity gradient that is already known for that galaxy. Um, and um, it is uh, very interesting. So the MUSE data sets are incredibly handy when it comes to discovering new wolf ray stars because there are plenty that have not been uh, discovered so far. You can, you can make just naively, you can make uh, nitrogen three or nitrogen four or carbon maps, and then um, you can you can really just see all the Wolf Ray stars coming up like that, and then do um, some nice number counting. 
and relate that to the um, helicity gradient, which, uh, uh, yeah, again, results coming, <laughs> not ready yet. Um, and then extinction was your, your other question, right? Yes, that's a pain because you have to do it um, on a pixel by pixel basis. Uh, and I mean, you know, it's, it's nowadays computing um, facilities uh, are, are actually pretty good. So some, you can't run these things on your, on your laptop, but uh, it, it just takes for every cube a couple of hours. Um, uh, and you can extinction correct if you want every single spectral pixel in your cube and then, and then you're good to go. Thank you. Thanks, Mauricio. Uh, thank you very much uh, again, Anna. So let's all thank you, uh, thank Anna again. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for having me. And again, welcome to my living room. <laughs> <laughs>